Here's the deal. There are two ways to cut male threads. Either on a lathe using a single point cutting tool like this, which is great for precision but takes a bit of time, or with a thread die held in a die wrench, which is much faster. But the results are always such shit that I question if I'm even in the right trade. So I always end up starting over and single point threading anyway. Kinda defeats the purpose of the tool, right? There has to be a middle ground. So today, that's exactly what I'm gonna build. I've been waiting for a nice cold and rainy day for a project like this. I've got this care package here that was sent to me by a pretty swell fella named Eric. He's actually the same guy who sent me the knurling tool kit about a year ago. I'm obviously blown away by his continued generosity, but when I opened the package, there were a couple extra treats in here. He actually took the time to trace out the Inheritance machining logo and made a couple plaques, as well as a bunch of keychains. Actually, hang on, I've got just a spot for one of these. Now there are actually two kits in this box, but I'm only gonna focus on the tailstock die holder, which is exactly what it sounds like. It mounts in the tailstock, holds a die, and supposedly keeps your threads straight. Apparently Eric also has this kit that he hasn't built yet, so maybe he just wants me to do it first to see what not to do. At any rate, it's pretty nice to have the design taken care of, so I can just jump right into making. But just because I have drawings doesn't mean I can skip the planning. The kit actually came with instructions, but I'm going to do what any sane person would do and pretend like I never saw these. Honestly, it's just a lot more fun to try and figure it out on my own. Now the kit comes with stock, but it's not an unlimited amount, so I have to be careful about my operations so I don't back myself into a corner somehow. Most of the pieces are right at size or maybe have just a little bit extra for work holding. So I'll work through each of the parts here and make a list of the order of operations. And this actually acts as a shot list as I make this video. The design is meant for dies of 1 inch in diameter and 1 and 5 16 diameter, but this doesn't necessarily fit what I have, so I'm going to have to play with the design just a little bit. I primarily have these 1 inch hex dies, so I'll have to make an adapter for that. And then I also have these 1 inch and 1 and a half inch dies. If you couldn't tell, I've never actually used these, but with this new tool, I might be able to. So I'll let these soak in evaporust while I work on everything else and let these chill over here in the corner with this other continuous stream of parts I've got de-rusting. Now because I'm using slightly larger dies than this is intended for, I can't just use the stock that was supplied, at least on the large end. So I'll have to use a piece from my own stores. And I'll go ahead and start on this half of the die holder. Really, it's been over a month and a half since I've machined anything, and I've been starting to go through withdrawal, so this is pretty exciting. And honestly, that's another reason I'm doing this project. So I can just jump right into the fun stuff without having to do any design work. I'll start with facing the stock and turning down the diameter, which is a pretty typical operation, so let's just watch the chips. Still got it, baby. Next I'll work on the bore. Generally when I have to drill a big hole, I'll start with a much smaller drill than I need, like this 2164. This size isn't really going to be used for anything because it's not a common tap drill size or really a common size at all, and it clears out enough material so that when I bring in the big drill it doesn't have to work as hard. Now to guarantee my hole is straight and accurate, I'll have to finish this out with the boring bar. I don't know what it is, but boring for me always takes a little bit of trial and error. That squeal is no bueno. But raising the cutter about 10 thou above center line and cutting the RPM in half seems to do the trick. Yeah, I'd say that'll do just fine. Now before I do the remaining cuts, I need to set the compound slide to 30 degrees so I can cut the conical shape on this part. I can do this accurately by running the dial indicator along the tailstock while sweeping the compound. Turns out 30 degrees is one of those cool angles where the length of the hypotenuse is twice the length of the short side. 
So basically, the reading on the dial indicator should be half the distance I travel on the compound hand wheel. And with that all locked down, the last thing to do is make sure that my cutter is perfectly on center line. This will be critical when I go to cut the cone shape, because if I'm just a bit above or below center line, I'll actually cut a slightly hyperbolic shape. Maybe I'm being a bit hyperbolic in even considering this, but might as well. I'll start by hogging away most of the material to form the minor diameter, and then use the compound slide to cut the taper. Once I get everything close, I'll take a finishing pass along both the minor diameter and the taper to take it all to dimension. Well, that didn't go so well. Even after a generous amount of polishing, this finish looks like dog shit. This might just be a factor of the blunt carbide insert I'm using, so I'm going to give this another go with something that looks a bit sharper. This seemed to be going alright, but then something kind of strange happened. The tool was just acting weird. I would go to take a cut and nothing would happen. And then I discovered this. Guess who forgot to tighten the tool? Let's try that again. Hey, there we go. While I'm here, I'll also use this tool to prepare the threaded area. Now to cut those threads. And oddly enough, the drawing calls for this really weird 7 8 by 26 TPI thread. Which you might know isn't one of the common UN, UNF, UNC, UNEF. There's literally no designation for this size. I feel like I've been throwing a curveball. Fortunately, my lathe does cut this pitch. and I don't even have to swap change gears, so this should be a cakewalk. Now even though this is a fine pitch thread, this is a very short threaded area. So I'm going to play it safe and cut these threads in reverse. To do this, I'll have to use my left-handed internal thread cutter and mount it upside down. This lets me cut everything away from the part. In the check the progress, I'll use the three wire method with a micrometer. Now I just want to clean up the inboard side of these threads a bit to make it look nicer. But I don't really feel like swapping around another tool, so I'll just use this thread cutter I've already got mounted. Which does a really good job of mushing up my threads, just like I wanted. Well that's one way to do that. Stupid. It doesn't look too bad, and it might actually still work. I'm not sure, so I'm going to drop a couple chamfers on here and think about what I want to do next. Okay, so I have two options. I can either continue and hope that it fits, of course there's the risk that it doesn't, or I can try to bring the threading tool back in here, realign it, and clean this up. And I gotta say, I kinda like that second option. I guess there's no better time to try something new than when it's for all the marbles, right? Just to point out the less obvious, I can't just re-engage the thread feed because I've already disconnected it all. So when I do re-engage it, everything's misaligned. But I can fix this with some small adjustments to the cross sliding compound to bring the cutter back into alignment. But let me get the camera out of the way so I can actually see what I'm doing and make sure it's actually dead nuts. And now that I've got it all realigned, I can just continue threading like before, getting rid of that mushy section. Okay, it may look like that didn't do much, because I may not have had much of a problem to begin with but I do feel about 30% better that this will work in the end, so let's keep moving. To work on the other side, I need to flip the part. This is a perfect job for the four jaw chuck and my fancy dancy soft jaws I made recently. These will protect my already finished surfaces from the abuse of the hardened steel jaws. Of course this means I have to take some time to align the part, but I'm getting pretty speedy at this, so no big deal. On this side, it's the more very familiar operations of facing this to length and boring out the pocket for the dies. Now the dies are adjustable, so I can't just turn these to an exact fit for them. And there's actually some variation in the diameter between the dies anyway. So I'm making this pocket a couple thou larger than the largest die. This actually has me a little bit concerned because it means the dies won't be perfectly on center when they're mounted. 
but I guess I won't know how big of a factor that is until the end. After adding chamfers, of course, the last thing is to drill the set screw holes. I could go through the whole process of dragging out my massive rotary table, but I don't really feel like doing all that. So I'm just going to keep it simple and use a collet block to hold this in the mill. The set screws that go in these holes align with little detents that are in the edges of the dies, but I'm actually going to drill the hole about 5 thou further inboard than the center line of the die. This should help the set screws pull the die against the back face to keep them straight. Yep, that's pretty much perfect. Let's keep the ball rolling and make the next piece that this threads into. I'd like to find out sooner rather than later if I'm actually going to have a problem with my little whoopsie here. I'm just going to keep the four jaw mounted from here on out, even though it takes a little more time to dial everything in. Constantly swapping chucks doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me today. I'm coming at this one from the opposite end, starting with the die mounting features. So after facing and cleaning up the diameter, I'll work on the different bores. After of course chamfering everything in sight, I'll flip the part, indicate once again, and work on the 30 degree taper. Now because I haven't adjusted anything on the compound slide, this taper should come out exactly like the first one, which is important for the clutch mechanism to work properly. After some scotch Brite magic, I'll prepare the bore for some threads. If ever there was a time to play it safe and cut threads away from the part, it's certainly when adding them blindly inside a bore but I'll have to switch my left-handed cutter for a right one here. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know, you know what I mean. I'm switching the cutters so that I can run everything in reverse to cut the threads. Of course I didn't bother calculating exactly how much I needed to cut away to get the threads to match the first part, so I ended up playing the game of cut, test, cut, test, cut, test for half an hour until I finally nailed it. But nail it, I did. And my thread repair job on the first part seems to be a non-issue. Woohoo! This leaves the last step on the mill of tapping the two set screw holes, only I opted not to use the collar block this time, mostly because there was no way to actually grab onto it. But with some clever fixturing, I was able to drill completely through both sides, and then after tapping the first, rotate the part and use the drill and the vice stop to realign the part for tapping the second side. Alright, that's the first two main parts of the body complete. Unfortunately, my little mishap on the threads is not a problem. So now we can move on to the pair of clutch cones that fits between these two die holders. The stock that came with the kit has hardly any extra length on it, so I'm not going to worry about turning the outside just yet. Instead, I'll jump right on to working on the bore. First drilling it out with this beefy boy. Then finishing things up with the boring bar, including facing this to length, and then using the compound slide to cut the taper. Now something I haven't mentioned yet is that when I'm cutting all these tapers, I have to account for the tool radius. Here, look at this. All blown up, this is the tool radius of the cutter, and this is the zero point of that cutter. Now imagine I'm cutting this taper. If I just try to trace my zero point along that angle, I'll end up leaving more material here than I mean to. I need to either shift one axis or the other to compensate for this. I'll spare you the questionable trig lesson, but I ended up determining that for my 164 tool radius at a 30 degree angle, I need to shift my x-axis 7th thou further out on the radius. So back on the lathe, that's exactly what I'll do to take the finishing pass. With that side all tied up, I'll flip this back around, indicate it in, and bring this side down to length. But of course it's not that easy. When checking the progress, I discovered that the thickness isn't consistent all the way around. No surprise here since I only dialed this in on the center axis. It could still be slightly at an angle, which it apparently is. So to fix this, I'll mark the high and low points, and then gingerly make some adjustments before skimming the face again. And then just repeat this 15 more times until the perfectionist in me says, good enough. Alright, let's see how it fits. I also went ahead and whipped up the second one off camera. That's pretty nice. Just a few more things now, starting with turning down the outside diameter. 
which I inadvertently made the perfect fixture for holding these in the lathe. Alright, that looks pretty good. Just one more task now. Back on the mill, I'll get one of these clamped in some V-blocks, and then use the coaxial indicator to find the center axis. And then just bring an end mill in here to cut the slot. After a little bit of cleanup with the file, these are looking great and they fit perfectly on the assembly. I think now's a good time to work on the guide pin that all this will ride along. I'm pretty satisfied with the outside tolerance of what was supplied, so I just have the simple operations of tapping a hole in one end and drilling out the bore of the other. And of course some scotch brite to get this looking on par with the rest of the build. Alright, next is the arbor that this all mounts to, and the kit came with a pre-made Morse taper blank, which I appreciate not having to make. So all I have to do is turn down a male threaded stud on the end here. What are you looking at, weirdo? But I can't just grab this in the chuck because of the taper. Fortunately, my grandfather liked to buy tools, which included every Morse taper adapter known to man. And to my surprise, I actually found the one that I needed had never even been opened. It's literally brand new. I'll be at 30 years old. This has only happened a couple times in this shop, and it's pretty special when it does. So I'll get the Morse 3 to 4 attached, and then the 4 to 5, and then pop this right in the lathe spindle. And just for funsies, check the run out. That's really not bad at all. I think I can live with that. From here, it's just turning down a short nubbins for a thread. All right, let's see how the guide pin fits. Okay, while it goes on all right, the runout is absolutely atrocious. You can literally see it, and the dial indicator is freaking out as well. I was worried that I may have scrapped this Morse taper blank, but then I realized the more likely culprit. Because I just drilled and tapped the hole in the end of the guide pin, there's no guarantee that it actually was straight, and that's the deflection I'm seeing now. So I guess I have no choice but to remake this. And make the first donation of the project. Okay, it might seem like insanity that I'm also tapping this remake, but hold tight, I have a plan. With that hole tapped in the end, I can switch back to the Morse taper arbor and screw the pin on, and then just start turning all the rest of the features. Even if that threaded hole is crooked, it won't matter because I'm turning this all down in situ. Alright, much better. I think I can live with a couple thou run out. And honestly, I think this little bit of run out that I am seeing is just from the slight warping of the bar as I remove material. And I also nailed the fit, just like the original bar, so the rest of the assembly slides on here perfectly. So let's go ahead and finish out the rest of the build and make the handle actuator thingamajig. Once again, the supplied stock is right at dimension, but appearances are important to me. So I'm going to compromise on the size a little bit in favor of a nicer surface finish. There's sort of a central pocket that gets milled away, so I'll drill out the four corners just a bit undersized to make the mill's job a little less hard. Then I'll bring in the roughing mill to do most of the heavy lifting. With that all hogged away, I'll switch to a carbide finishing mill to take this all to dimension. Then lastly, this little guy to clean up the tighter corners. Not bad, but this is still missing something pretty important.
Much better. And I think I blended those chamfers pretty well. Next I'll sand this up in the middle and cut away this gap sort of thing in the middle. And just to make this a little less chaotic, I'm leaving a small sliver at the bottom until the finishing passes just to give everything a little bit more rigidity. And of course now I have several new edges that also need chamfers. And the final step is tapping the hole for the handle. Now for something a lot more fun, putting rounds on all the corners. A perfect job for my badass radiusing fixture. I've been looking forward to using this all project. I think so far this might be one of my favorite builds. It does need some minor setup though, so bear with me. Alright, I've got everything dialed in to cut a quarter inch radius on the corners, so now it's just a matter of bringing the end mill in and sweeping the table. Yep, that never gets old. Working through the rest is just a matter of remounting the part, clamping it down, and running the mill across those corners as well. Now this begs the question, what about chamfering these edges? Well, I can do that all here too, including the chamfers on the corner rounds. How freaking nice is that? Man, you gotta love it when you can beautifully chamfer every single edge of a part. Let's go ahead and get this in place. That feels pretty good. I had to leave a little bit of play for the mechanism. Oh wait, actually something isn't right. When I push on the actuator, it engages on the sides rather than on the ends to activate the clutch. And I know exactly why I'm having this problem. I thought I'd be clever and make this a tighter fit than the drawing calls for. Fortunately, I can just drop these back in the mill, indicate them, and then open up that slot to the correct distance. Okay, there we go. It feels a bit sloppy, but I guess that's just how this mechanism works. Anyway, with that done, I just need to make the handle. Which after a little bit of this, and this, I've got a nice rod here that I can just thread into place. And that means I can finally attach the knob that came supplied with the kit. But if you've been around here for a while, you may know I have a thing about knobs. <laughs> Wait, that didn't come out right. Anyway, this plastic one isn't going to cut it. So let's make something a little more fitting. I'm just going to wing this, and knurling seems like a good place to start. And obviously I need a threaded hole for the handle. Though I will spice this up with some bevels and grooves. And then finish the other side to match. Damn, I guess that's what I get for coming out this without a plan. But in truth, I'm not really a fan of how this turned out anyway. It's a bit too generic for my taste. So let's try something else. I have an idea for cutting a large diamond pattern on the perimeter of this. And I should be able to use my thread feed to do that, but my lathe will only cut up to a 4 TPI thread, which I think is too fine. So I'm going to play around with the change gears a bit to double that ratio. I spent way too much time in Excel sorting through the over 17,000 combinations of change gears to find the one that would do this. Only to realize I can just swap the 60 and 126 tooth gears for an 80 and an 84. But at least now I have a way to calculate literally any thread pitch that I can imagine. Anyway, with that now set up, I can use the thread feed like normal to cut the pattern in one direction. 
and then reverse the feed to cut the other. Now that looks freaking stylish. I'll finish this out with some similar end details in the mounting hole and let the Scotch-Brite do its thing. Now that is a hell of a lot cooler than this cheap plastic ball. And with this, that's the build complete. Or is it? There's just one more bit to make. The adapter for the hex dies. Luckily I have leftover material that's perfect for this job. I think you get the idea of what a lot of these operations look like. So I'm just going to jump ahead to the cool stuff. Which is cutting the hex pocket. Finally all the work I put into making this hex collet block is going to pay off as it's the perfect tool for this job. Longtime viewers will know my struggle. Anyway, with this standing up, I can cut two flats at a time with a small eighth inch end mill, but I also have to overcut on one side of each for corner clearance. And of course, since we've chamfered literally everything else on this project, this isn't slipping by either. Now that looks absolutely delicious. Just the way all those chamfers tie in with all the overcuts. Mwah. And the die fits perfectly. I'll finish this out with some set screw holes and detents, and then do a quick reskim on the bottom face to smooth it back out, and we're done. And actually done this time, so let's do final assembly. Man, I really like how this turned out. I managed to chamfer literally every single edge on every single part, and I especially like the extra flare of the brass knob. I guess you could say it really looks dialed in. But this is more than just a showpiece, so it's time to see if this is actually going to work. The main advantage of this tool is that it keeps the die straight and on center, and it all slides freely along this tailstock mounted rod. Well, maybe after a little grease that is. Now I should be able to bring this in on some stock I've prepared, and pushing the lever both slides the tool forward and activates the cone clutch mechanism. Then just releasing that lever disengages it. This is actually pretty neat. The sudden grabbing is a little jarring, but I suppose that's to be expected. Reversing is the same deal where pulling the lever engages the clutch, threading the die off the part. Now that looks really nice. I can't really see any unevenness in the threads. As an example, here's one I made with my die wrench. That's a pretty substantial improvement. But now how about something larger? This is one of those adjustable dies that I was worried about because I had to leave the mounting holes slightly larger for them to fit. Man, this bigger size really grabs. You gotta be ready for it for sure. Also, in theory, I should be able to thread right up to the face and it should overcome the clutch before anything breaks. Just like that. Okay, those came out a bit more wonky than that first test, but still acceptable in some applications. Let's do one more. This is definitely a two-hander, which makes this clutch mechanism even more impressive. Now these threads came out much better, not even a hint of wobble to them, and I'm certainly pleased with that. You know, I was kind of skeptical when Eric sent along this project. With the precision I aim for in most of my projects, I almost always go with single point threading. But really, the results of this holder are more than acceptable for most jobs. And the ease of use compared to setting up the lathe and taking dozens of passes is actually really appealing. I may find myself using this thing a lot if for no other reason than to justify all the time I spent making it. Sunk cost fallacy, say what? Thanks again, Eric, for sending along this fun project. And to everyone else, thanks for watching, and see you next time.